Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Matthew Feeney. And today we're joined by John Samples. He's a vice president here at the Cato Institute. And he founded and directs Cato's Center for Representative Government and the First Amendment Project. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, John. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk about institutions today and what's happened to America's political institutions in the last year. Um, but let's when, pe when people use that term, when we talk about America's political institutions, what do we mean? What are we talking about? Well, I think you're talking about the rules and practices in the constitutional framework, right? Uh, the concern, I think, about the last year when we started the year was that, you know, there would be – we have a system of government where it's divided powers, the powers are balanced. We had elected a president who seemed to be unhappy with a lot of that and he also seemed to have strong populist streak and that he was going to threaten that kind of both – uh, the non-presidential institutions, maybe the courts, maybe other, maybe this, whatever, the states, and uh, that uh, he would uh, essentially bring that kind of fragmented liberal democracy uh, further down the road toward being something else, a much more non-liberal democracy, but populist. And the institutions then would, uh, which are in the American system are really designed and were designed to stop someone like uh, a populist, a demagogue, uh, that they would uh, not be able up to the task, that they, the division of powers would not stop him. The, the sort of – I mean the First Amendment itself is an institution, the protections for freedom of speech backed by the courts. That's an institution that constrains someone who is uh, a populist, a demagogue and so on. How do you think that the institutions have fed in in, in doing uh, doing that job? I remember in, in the wake of the election, a lot of my uh, anti-Trump friends or acquaintances were, were complaining and uh, my own thoughts on it were, well, w let's see how the institutions hold up. Let's mm. think about the courts and uh, courts are pretty robust and uh, I was trying to remain uh, optimistic <laughs> in these days. Uh, how, how, how well do you think they've actually fed? I think for most people who were concerned at the beginning of 2017, they've probably done better than expected. In retrospect, an early sign was uh, when he or Steve Bannon and, and Steve Miller wrote the uh, executive order about the, those uh, predominantly Muslim countries. And that ran into, first of all, just sort of practical problems, but also ran into uh, the courts and was, you know, essentially ran and was basically struck down and had to be revised and all sorts of things. That was an early good sign in that uh, President Trump did not say, you know, John Marshall, like Andrew Jackson said, or is alleged to have said, John Marshall has made his decision, let him enforce it. He didn't, in other words, Donald Trump didn't say, I'm not uh, these, you know, I'm going to make America safe. I'm going to do what I was elected to do. I have the mandate. I'm going forward to protect America. Instead, he dropped back and they did what they anybody would do in that situation or what most administrations would do is they started to try to get their act together to write something that could get through the courts. So that was a good sign that uh, for all the bluster and everything, he wasn't up to high-scale constitutional crises and, and you know, provoking them. Uh, and in general, you would have to say – if I had one indication of uh, he's had a lot of resistance, the press has been very resistant, he's been very abusive to the press and so on. If I had to say there was one thing that indicated his difficulties, it's that you have a really good economy now, in some ways a stronger economy than we've had for a decade. So usually presidents really uh, get a good boost from that, particularly their, uh, their public approval of what they're doing, right? So Donald Trump really should be in the 52, 54 range uh, in terms of public support uh, favoring his, the way he's doing his job. And that's you know fairly high, fairly good rating. But he is in fact struggling along in the high 30s. Maybe the occasional poll will give you a 41, 42. So I think what we can say is because of his behavior and the fear he invokes, that he's probably paid a price of about uh, 10 points at least and maybe more. The other thing is uh, he's well on his way to causing another tripwire to go off, 
which is elections are supposed to. That's why we have not just everybody elected at the same time. You have the House and the Senate are off years and one third of the Senate and so on. Uh, it does. It looks like the Republican Party is going to have a terrible blowout in in 2018. The the sort of I'm referring here to the uh, there's a generic party preference, which is a fairly good indicator about where things are going. Uh, is that unpre- I mean, I heard there was a 17 point difference just, and then we've had something like 13 point differences throughout uh, the latter part of the fall. That is, people preferred the Democrats in general about the, the congressional elections to the Republicans. This is a number that's usually in the three to four. Maybe when Republicans are going to do well, they're going to have a two or three point advantage. But usually, you know, these sort of things where 20 seats change hands are in that area. 17 points? I mean, they could lose 50 or 60 seats the way we're looking, which would be, I mean, one thing you would say about Donald Trump, this pushback and the elections kicking in and him essentially really mobilizing his opponents. They really want to do something to stop him. All of that uh, could bring, you know, could be paid in a cost to economic liberty, although he himself is not all that big on economic liberty. Uh, it could be in that you get a um, a administration 2020 that has a majority that wants to do a lot more on taxes, a lot more on regulation and so on. And so in a sense, even though many libertarians, in my impression, uh, and there's Donald Trump is not a libertarian. He's uh, an anti-libertarian, right, in many ways. My impression is that, um, you know, he could cause an anti-libertarian backlash on the economic side that could be very difficult in post-2020. So it's, you know, there's that. But I would say I think there is another area that's really problematic in institutions, this question of norms, though. Where he's done has the where he, generally where he has the ability to do damage, he really has. Um, just today, as we sit here, of course, you know, there's so many examples, right? Every week seems to bring two or three things that he says or tweets that then are discussed widely, and they're ju- and they're always behavior. You notice there's two aspects to it, is it right? People have certain expectations about what the president of the United States will do, and then he does it. It, that's a norm, mm-hmm. and then he contradicts it in some way. Now, of course, now what's going on as we tape this is that uh, he's called certain countries by a vulgar name in the middle of a negotiation session. I mean, and then it's gotten out into public, and this is just not something one expects from a president. He violates that norm. But, you know, it is interesting. I think he's worse in a lot of ways because norm violation is actually pretty common. Let me give you an example um, about what I'm talking about. You know, we expect that maybe libertarians don't, but many, many Americans do, that presidents won't lie. But it's pretty clear that in uh, the run-up to the uh, Obamacare vote uh, that President uh, Obama at the time – um, did lie about whether you would get to keep your insurance. He had every reason to know that many people wouldn't be able to. It had been a problem. Be, they'd been honest about this in, in 96 and it didn't work. So President Obama, you know, I think he knew that people would lose it and he said that because he was wanted – why did he do that? He wanted to – he thought – it's a classic political thing that Aaron talks about quite a bit actually, which is – he, the greater good, he wanted to break the norm of not lying to achieve what he saw as, you know, uh, coverage for other, for people, extending coverage. So that's kind of a typical thing, you know, that we have a norm and President Obama, I think, would have said, well, the, he would have subscribed to the norm, but he's, in that case, he, there was this other thing he wanted to do, and so he he violated it. But he didn't say, "Oh, you know, lying all the time is okay." And he didn't. And you also came out of it saying, "We didn't think there are no norms." The thing about uh, President Trump is he breaks norms all the time, including the one about lying, and he doesn't do it for any particular reason I can think of, except to just sort of. Can, am I wrong about this? Uh, doesn't I seem mean, to be able to help himself. It seems yeah. that 
the constant reporting coming from inside the White House and from people who've interacted with him is it doesn't sound like he's the kind of creature that has reasons. Um, that that's just cause and effect, and is kind of cognitively beyond beyond him. Um, so he's, I think, he just is acting out. Um, it's just the way he acts. But I want to I want to ask about these norms because he is yes, left and right. He is breaking norms, um, refusing to follow along with norms. But that doesn't seem like that's quite the same thing as him changing norms or even really threatening to change norms because. He is wildly unpopular and the result when he breaks one of these norms, when he says something, is a huge backlash from the majority of people. You know, I mean, he, you, get his, you get his core base of supporters, which isn't even the you know, 37 to 40 percent of the country who approve of him. Typically, it's, it's an even smaller number are his really hardcore base. Like they, the, the you know, self-described deplorables, they eat this stuff up, but they were never part of those norms anyway. Uh, we just kind of could safely ignore them because they didn't have any power. But the the rest of the country seems – it's almost like when he does this, the rest of the country doubles down on its assertion of the original violated norm and, and says, no, 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 this is really important. We're going to enforce it. We're going to shame those who don't. And so the I guess I could see a pot that the likelihood my prediction would be if they had – if the Trumpkins head to an overwhelming defeat in 2018. Um, if Trump either chooses not to run again in 2020 or gets demolished in 2020, and you so you drive that that portion of the American right into the wilderness, um, the rest of the country has spent these years effectively practicing norm enforcement of the original norms and thinking about them and flexing those muscles. And so I think if anything, he there's a chance he could be strengthening those norms in the long run. As John mentioned, we're, we're recording this in the wake of uh, the president saying something disparaging about- so uh, Friday, kind of, January 12th. Friday, January 12th. And uh, the president is uh, reported to have said something very disparaging about a few countries. And uh, journalists are very upset about this and uh, the press is running with it. But a lot of the commentary you hear is, you know what, this is how real people talk. And uh, actually, he's a man of the people. And, and so, some critical thing to remember, I think, is that these institutions that we're talking about are inherently elitist in the sense of the courts, uh, the, the politicians, uh, journalism. Uh, these are all uh, rather elite. And, and I, I hope that Aaron is right that actually a, a lot of this stuff is actually unpopular out um, in what people call real America. But... Uh, I don't know. Is there something to worry about in the sense that we're relying on inherently elitist institutions? You've got to rely on elite institutions anywhere you go. But Aaron makes a good case and it's possible. And we do see that, although there are a certain amount, it's been one year, a certain amount of exhaustion may, may, and to some extent maybe has already set in. There's talk of, you know, uh, adapting to him and accepting him. I think the problem here is that unlike Go back to uh, Barack Obama for a minute. President Obama, as I said, uh, may have broken the norm about lying, all right? But he didn't deny the norm. He, he wouldn't deny. He might deny that he broke it if he were here with us, but he would still believe in the norm. I, I generally think that. President Trump breaks the norm and there's a, this frequency problem. He does it all the time. He does five times before breakfast, right? Five but, tweets before breakfast. Yeah, well, they usually – high. most of them involve norm breaking. But he also appears to deny that there could – that norms are valuable. Now, the problem is – or that they're binding or that they should be binding, right? Because everyone breaks norms in one way or the other at some point. But what's different about him is the idea that I think there's an underlying thing, an underlying view that – it's all BS anyway, and I'm just going to – I'm burning the house down here, right? And the house is these norms. Now, here's where Aaron and I could possibly differ, just the way it works out differs. The people who are concerned about this are often people who say the president has a – it's the, very important that the president is doing this because people are not sort of – they're not libertarian the way we always want libertarian people to be independent-minded, to make up their own mind, to stay away from partisanship, all this stuff. 
people look to the president as a leader who who sets you know a kind of uh, moral uh, structure or whatever for or just actually examples for people to follow, and that if the president is doing this despite all of the good pushback, and despite you know, and uh, all of that, that it's going to affect the underlying culture of the society such that when it's somewhat and that if he's the first of many like this, right, we've fallen and we can't get back up, then this is going to be an acceptable way. It's just to be a different set of norms that will be, but norms, the very idea of these non-constitutional, non-legal, non-statutory things that we accept, it will itself be gone. And so everyone will be burning down the house all the time, and that'll be the way you win, right? Uh, so I don't know what you're the. I, it, I agree with you though. I see your point in the sense that it does look like um, the system is working better, and it's also now there, there's also they <clears throat> a lot of people have followed him down his particular rabbit hole. So you think about significant national newspapers that have stuff about him, or news channels that have stuff about him all the time. Uh, you know they're going to have they're going to be a different institution after this administration is over than they were going in, right? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Some people, you might say, well, they were always partisan anyway. They were just more careful about it. But he's essentially dragged everyone down with him. And Ross Duthat had this uh, piece in March of last year at the beginning when he said he urged the, you know, the DC media and so on not to go down the rabbit hole with him. But most have, right? The, I think the things are going better than expected, I guess I would say, but I'm worried about the effects of this over time and that are kind of incremental and so on. Uh, and it is because he's the president and uh, he also doesn't seem to do, he uh, uh, doesn't agree that the president should offer any kind of model of behavior, which you have to say is very different from for all of the things I would disagree with with the previous two presidents was not true, right? They had a sense of you had to do this stuff. He seems to think, uh, well, you just do anything and screw it. I mean, that's if that was that, if I had to say one thing, that was it, you yeah. know? When you were giving your assessment of how America's political institutions have functioned and stood up to Trump in the last year, um, and and you said so, you said that they they basically they stood up better than you than many feared mm -hmm. they would, um, and I'm curious about why that is. Mm -hmm. Like, so what the the lesson to draw from that regarding our institutions and their enduring strength. Because on the one hand, you could draw the lesson that our institutions are stronger than we thought they were. Um, but the other thing we might learn from it is simply that Donald Trump turned out to be far more breathtakingly incompetent than we expected him to be. Um, so do you do you think one of those is the stronger case? Do you think that the institutions are in fact slightly stronger than we thought? In a situation like this, the thing, that lesson you don't learn is very important, right? It could be very important. And by that I mean uh, we may con we could conclude right now, oh, you know, he was president and that seemed really bad and everything, but the institutions held up. Let's not worry. We don't have to worry about it. However, I think you're correct. I think that in a sense we got lucky and surprisingly so because uh, he doesn't behave like any politician in a way. Uh, in other words, he doesn't even do things that are seem to be, you know, to advance his power and popularity and so on. And he also seems uh, completely unfamiliar with the job and unwilling to learn anything about it. And actually, you know, um, uh, it. He does seem to be, in a sense, the country lucked out to the extent that he is an actual threat. Um, and he's incompetent. It also could be that he's redefining the job of president. It could be the incompetence is such in terms of actual governance. He doesn't really try all that much to govern, um, as far as I can tell. Um, although people in his administration certainly do. 
But you may have a bifurcation here in that the president may become entertainer in chief. He sort of goes around calling the other side names and saying outrageous things just as if he were on television in some way. And then there's the rest of the administration that's filled with sort of, you know, depending people that are, have some experience and they can get whatever's done, which you can get through Congress and the bureaucracy and so on. And so you have a new American presidency, which is that, and then this business about Oprah Winfrey running for president, which was, you know, was greeted with, uh, you know, we don't know that she wouldn't be a very strong candidate uh, in, in terms of winning a general election. But she would, I think, even though she seems to be somewhat different in personality, um, she would be a continuation of that model, right, in which you have no p political experience needed, but you really should be on TV and be entertaining if you want to be president. And then you've, what you will have done is cut whatever connection there was between elections and the deliberation of sorts before that and the governance. The president offers in some way the one place where elections don't translate directly into policy, but they are connected. I mean, that makes me wonder <laughs> about what you said earlier about norms, which is that, that norms can change uh, and, and uh, powerful people change them, uh, whether deliberately or not deliberately. And I sometimes wonder if Trump uh, inadvertently is actually uh, changing politics in a sense where it becomes considered totally normal for someone like Oprah Winfrey to run for president. And uh, in 2020 or 2024, we'll just have to deal with uh, a bunch of former celebrities or current celebrities who think in light of Trump that this is a normal thing and that the norm, which was that uh, career politicians run for president, will have been broken. Now, net positive or not benefit, I guess it's too soon to tell, but norms change. Speaking about norms and wishing to be considered fair by anyone, I mean, I think also... But anyone listening to this, I mean, I, I think the you have to take into account that um, the, the person who ran against him, though he keeps running against her despite the fact that the election's over, many people were against her because they believed with more than a little reason that the norms that apply to everyone else, uh, say, you know, lower level people in the intelligence apparatus, didn't apply to her. She was a. She could violate those norms in setting up the email and all that stuff, and uh, that uh, she that and that an entire and Trump ran basically on the idea that a, an entire elite was full of it on those things. They didn't follow those kinds of. But you know the other thing we haven't mentioned is things like breaking norms about instructing, you know, members of the Justice Department to prosecute his former opponent. And during the, I mean, I, I still, I think, will remember for the rest of my life the Republican National Convention when you have a chance, the chant is put the other opponent in jail. These were not things that, I mean, maybe you know, there was a lot of BS going, there always was in politics and campaigns, but that was striking, even though she had broken the, you know, she was, there was a bunch of stuff that's true about her, but... Going forward then, so this so this fear that we – our electoral system switches to something where it's – if you want to win the presidency, you have to be a big celebrity who's been on TV and so we get big celebrities who've been on TV as our presidents. Um, how much control do the parties have over that? Like Trump, Trump won because of the way that the primary system – worked. Um, could if the if the two major parties decided that it was not in their interests to live in that kind of world for whatever reason, um, could they flex their muscles, change up those systems and try to prevent it from happening? So here I'm going to go with an authority, my friend Bob Bauer, who knows about as much as about he's worked for the Democratic Party for many years and knows about as much about parties um, and he te as it works, he happens to be around people who say, oh, we need you know, stronger parties and 
uh, some, in some ways the 1968 situation, right? Bobby Kennedy won a primary, but he wasn't going to get the nomination because the party elders or the party leaders said, this is our guy as Humphrey. Can you, can you have stronger parties? And Bauer's view is you really shouldn't go down that path because you just there's no way to get to it, right? You, the, you can't build parties back that way. Uh, certainly, that would be the kind of elite uh, um, uh, filtering process. You keep coming back to James Madison in Federalist 10, right? Filtering. The word is filtering. We're trying to filter the popular will into things that are truly in the best interest of the entire undertaking, including the permanent interest of the society, he says. Well, that would be a filtering device, but it's not – I mean the Democrats are probably in better shape to do that. But uh, again, these people that we're talking about, if this happens, it will be because they're very popular, right? It will be – Oprah will get the nomination because she will be uh, highly likely to beat Donald Trump or other candidates. Um, so I don't think we can count on the parties to stop that. We've sort of blown out that constraint in a way. So, so far we've talked about I guess, institutions that have clear boundaries or definitions, things like the court system and also ones that are slightly more nebulous. So the press, which seems to apply to everything from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, CNN, but also to uh, blogs that uh, some people would consider now to be included in this umbrella of the press. But there's another institution that seems like the press to be rather poorly defined, which is this thing called the deep state that uh, has has got a lot of play in the last year or so. So I get a, a question uh, that you could answer for the listeners. What do people mean when they talk about the deep state and what kind of impact has it had on the first year of uh, Trump's presidency? I think it uh, depends on who you're talking to. If you take a very uh, negative view of the deep state, it's kind of permanent people, particularly who work in the intelligence and uh, perhaps also the judicial, uh, the ju justice department who are permanent members of the Washington bureaucracy. And therefore, uh, from this point of view, people who are exactly the people Donald Trump was talking about and people threatened by his uh, effort to drain the swamp and so on. Uh, more generally, I think you can talk, when you talk about the deep state, you're talking about the permanent bureaucracy. There's a lot of it. It's very. It, it's always been an issue uh, for pre any president coming in from uh, when they follow a member of the other party. It's always been the uh, a longstanding effort was to uh, or practice was for people to take political appointees and bury them in the bureaucracy and merit system jobs. And so, nice little bomb waiting there to impede the next administration. So over time, you have lots of uh, people inside a bureaucracy that for bureaucratic, partisan or other reasons, just, you know, the, remember the FBI agent talking about how bad Trump was and the insurance policy and all of that. That's sort of just an ideological or just a repulsion, right, as opposed to the partisanship or whatever. Um, these people... It makes, you know, you have – they have to in a sense – they don't have an absolute veto but they can impede you and that's what's happened. Going back to Aaron's comment about competence, I mean the problem of the – you know, you could say the special prosecutor was uh, part of the revenge of the deep state but that was just uh, – that you got yourself there uh, goes back to – I mean, if you're an experienced campaigner and politician and president, the one thing you do is you stay away from stuff that can come back and bite you, right? And so that's the, the campaign meeting with Russian agents, whatever happened, or Russian people, whatever happened there, uh, just apart from that. You stay away from that. You, you don't do things like firing Comey and so on. You try to – he's um, – I think in some ways Mr. Trump believes his own rhetoric about the presidency that he's uh, – and uh, it's a rhetoric that sort of 
many of us bought in that the presidency was this overwhelming, he had it even more, which was, it was kind of like a king in which everything was a prerogative. You just had discretion on everything, including libel laws, he seems to, seemed to think. Other people had like, it's too strong, but we didn't believe it had all of those prerogatives, so we wanted it constitutionally. Uh, he seems to believe it was uh, like a king, and um, he acted on that belief, and that's caused a lot of his problems, I think. Maybe it's of some reassurance that, at least for the president, it seems to be an instinct rather than a thought through ideology, and that he didn't, uh, it seems to me, when, when he fired Comey, it wasn't really clear that he didn't understand that uh, it's just not the sort of thing that presidents are supposed to do, which is to fire the FBI director without you know, a good cause. Uh, it, it just seemed that, that he instinctively uh, wanted to get rid of him and and proceeded. Uh, and, and so perhaps the ignorance of the norms uh, will help us in the long run. Yeah, I think that's an instance where his – he's. I mean Trump seems to be someone who clearly cannot update information. Um, he like – he just – he has a way of thinking about things and that's the way things are and he's not – he can't change it. Um, and the, I mean the Comey thing was fascinating because – not only did he not realize that wasn't the kind of thing a president should do, but he genuinely thought that just firing Comey would would kind of end the whole thing, mm -hmm. um, at, which was very clear that that's like in his businesses where he was the king in effect. Um, if there was someone he didn't like, he just got rid of them and then they went away and he never had to hear about them again. Um, and so he just kind of assumes that that's the way that that, that suddenly – the United States, the United States government and the United States writ large is now just like the Trump organization and he can act the same way um, and he has the same degree of power. Um, there was – I can't remember where it was reported but the talk of when he was running um, – it was Kellyanne Conway who said this but talking about how when he won, all of these people who disrespected him were suddenly going to have to respect him. We're suddenly going to have to like, you know, they thought that that's how it worked, um, and to just not to fundamentally not get that this system is so different that firing Comey would only make things dramatically worse in a way that he would be powerless to do anything about. Like he just he seems stuck in this like mindset of running his small family business, which is what you know the Trump organization was really a small business in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, and he just can't. He can't figure out that he's in a different environment and so he's like just doing the same things with disastrous results as far as he's concerned. Well, there's also I think a larger picture here that has run its course now and may continue running this way. Uh, you know, in a way if you look at Watergate, the presidents elected afterwards were frequently outsiders and there was this a kind of narrative that seemed to fit which is the outsider comes from the states, so frequently a governor, and he's going to clean up Washington, drain the swamp, and make everything. Now, with Carter and Reagan and Clinton even, you did have people who were professional politicians who had political experience. They had some idea, particularly with Reagan, had run a small country for eight years and so on, but also the other two, and they had their ups and downs and so on. But the, the search for the outsider the man on the white horse in a way. But the outside, Americans are big about the, you know, pure, the pure guy from outside that's not tainted by the system. Even Bush, uh, George W. from – George H.W. is the only one that's the insider, right? H.W. And, and Barack Obama for a variety of reasons, even though he was a senator, was an outsider in many ways. You could see him that way. And Trump is the ultimate person like that. He is the guy that's going to come and drain the swamp and blow it up and burn it down and make it all better. And that's just not the way you actually make things better. You know, it, it's, it may seem – it takes a degree – if you're going to – I mean for our agenda somehow, if we were going to get serious buy-in and serious uh, changes toward it, is going to take people that can convince others to do it, is going to have political experience and knows how to get uh, Congress to do it. One thing that I have found myself thinking about in this first year is so we talk about the notion of rational ignorance among voters that um, and that that can explain why voters often make bad decisions because it's not in their, you know, 
it's not in their best interest to spend the amount of time studying policy issues and economics and law and all of that that you would need in order to really know the difference between these candidates or know how these policies would play out. Um, and that's a – that kind of ignorance is – I mean we call it rational. It's like – so it's in a sense it's, it's like excusable ignorance because for most people given the insignificance of your vote, it would actually be the wrong decision for them to put that amount of investment in to learning this stuff. But the thing that struck me about Trump's election and then the way he – his first year has played out um, and, and then the, the core of his base that remains committed to him is there's a different sort of ignorance at play here that's not – that I think you can't call rational and in fact is a much more troubling kind of ignorance um, both – both in terms of what it did here and going forward but also in terms of I think the nature of democracy mm -hmm. and that's like an ignorance of – you know, if I put it – if I were to put it in um, virtue ethical terms as I frequently do on Free Thoughts, it would be an ignorance in the practical and intellectual virtues, mm -hmm. like an, inabil an absolute inability to recognize basic competence that like it was obvious it was obvious throughout the whole campaign that this was a man who regardless of his policies was utterly incompetent to govern um, and would be terrible when he got elected. That was – you know, you didn't – you know, you, that wasn't a partisan issue. Like everyone recognized that except suddenly a bunch of Americans didn't and a lot of Americans still don't and, and that seems to me to be a really troubling thing about American democracy and American electorate is not just that they're rationally ignorant about policy issues but they seem to have now displayed that they are incapable of recognizing basic human functioning to even do the job in the first place. That's possibly true. Uh, we don't know how many people of that uh, and how many new voters and so on. But I would say also of <laughs> remember the intellectual case for uh, Trump's election made by intellectual, a intellectual, was the Flight 93 election, right? And you, as you may know about the Flight 93 election, it's we're on Flight 93 that went down in Pennsylvania, uh, except it's an election. And Hillary Clinton is flying the plane and we know how this ends. And here's this guy over here that doesn't seem like he knows anything. Remember this was an article because uh, conservative intellectuals were having their doubts, let's say. And um, here's this guy over here, Donald Trump. You know, he may not be able to fly the plane, but we still should rush the cockpit and put him in and see if he can fly it because we know what the next alternative is. So I think a lot of people uh, saw it less as they didn't – they had some delusions about Donald Trump, I would guess, but we all have some delusions. But they saw her as so bad that um, in a way it was a better to take a chance. The plane was going to crash, you know, likely whatever you were doing because we were in a certain situation. But, you know, take a chance on him. And um, she, because he was better than her, than she was, even though you could acknowledge that she was bad. Now, I think it is an interesting question that you raise. I just don't know how I could sort out. We do know that, you know, uh, still... He got 90 million votes, uh, 90 percent of the Republican vote. That's about normal for a candidate. Uh, he got – he's maintained a pretty good approval rating among Republicans. It could also be that you're just – what you identify as ignorance is just a kind of – what I would talk about as an extreme partisanship that has gone too far. It's, it's sucked up everything in its path and so – it's all, all about red team or blue team and there's no independent – we see this in the public opinion data. Uh, people don't make independent – by and large, at least the people that move, don't make independent decisions about whether the federal government can do what is right most of the time. When their team is in, yes, the answer is it can. When their team is out, about 20 or 30 percent just shift over into the other column. Um, so it could be that while partisanship has its uses, it's just gotten out of hand here and people ignore – any you know, in a sense, maybe you could say uh, that the Flight 93 argument itself is a sign of partisanship out of control. To, to, to me, the, the, the whole argument just seemed to be a, 
a little strange uh, because the, the the analogies weren't working, at least when when I read the Flight 93 article. But we got to be careful about overstating the degree of support that. He, so yeah, ninety percent of Republican voters, but the President Trump. If I believe this is correct, had fewer votes than Mitt Romney in 2012. Uh, this, it's not as if there was this massive swell uh, of popular support. But your, your mention of Flight 93 reminded me of uh, P.J. O'Rourke's comment about about the election, where he said that uh, Clinton is, is wrong, but wrong within normal parameters. And and I think actually, it's really uh, quite important to keep within the normal parameters. Uh, that that. Uh, it it actually is worth even if you know that uh, you know a Clinton administration would be a disaster at least would be a disaster within uh, within the norm. Uh, now now it could be that like we mentioned earlier norms change and and uh, and the outcome of that remains to be seen. But it, isn't that important? Isn't it important to think? Yes, yeah, we've got to keep within some certain norms. We shouldn't just throw caution to the wind because we really 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 don't like the other candidate. Well, uh, that's the problem. It does seem like that uh, people had talked themselves into thinking that uh, he wasn't so bad or she was really bad, right? And, you know, there was, as I say, uh, reason to think that she was breaking norms. Uh, maybe it was overdone. But the other thing is you could say, well, we, what we've had here, to go back to a topic from a couple of minutes ago, I mean, what we have here is a fairly normal Republican administration with perhaps fewer, given that they have a majority in both houses, fewer achievements to their – but they got rid of a lot of regulation on the executive order side. So apart from the craziness at 1600 and his fighting with others and his behavior, this is just a maybe a little inexperienced but is a pretty normal administration. Now, we may – uh, I mean, one of the great concerns about the coming year is NAFTA stayed firm. You know, the trading system was okay in 2007, uh, last year and 2017, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the immigration stuff he, is starting to happen, but it, the actual big stuff on the you know, orders got stopped, blah, blah, blah. So there may be much worse to come, but it looks like kind of like um, you, you could argue that. Uh, but you can't argue that about the behavior of the uh, president. I've heard the argument that one of the reasons the Republican Congress seemed to look the other way on a lot of this and be somewhat protective of him and not critical of him and not distance themselves from him was because they wanted to get through their signature legislation. Um, and Obamacare failed in that regard and is likely off the table now. Um, but they just recently got their big tax bill through. Mm -hmm. um, with that now done, which was the other big one that they were hoping for, um, and especially with the prospect of a getting their clocks cleaned in 2018, um, do you think that we start to see more Republican members of Congress thinking I should distance myself from him, I should be more critical or even go so far as to thinking like we might be able to get a lot more done with Pence? I, w I guess I would say that uh, they're still – they don't have to worry about those issues but they may have to worry about uh, – they may be thinking about primary voters. They may th could be concerned that their voters don't – or a, you know, I mean, again, a pretty solidly placed House member is going to be a, in a 60-40 district, but if they lose 10 percent of the vote, they're in trouble. And there is, it does seem to be blood in the water. There do seem to be people retiring. There seem to be good quality Democrats coming out. It's really looking like a blowout's coming. And so if you go out there at least between now and Election Day and oppose him, uh, I think people are going to be afraid of being Jeff Flake electorally even though they might want to be Jeff Flake on the moral side of things. Um, so the behavior of Congress as a blocking mechanism does show something Gene Healy has said from time to time, which is the separation of powers doesn't work so well when you have high partisanship and uh, you know, a, um, a Congress that is controlled by the president's party. Um, I mean, he went. He was abusive of the, really abusive of the uh, both, not so much Ryan, but of uh, McConnell, 
And even that, McConnell is kind of like a very rational kind of, he doesn't get upset about things. But my God, that was that was kind of norm. I mean, you'd say those things behind, uh, behind their back or behind closed doors. One of the things, all the stuff he says has been said, he just says it all in public, right? And that's another breaking of a norm. Because when you say it behind closed doors, it means you know this is not something you should be doing. And he doesn't seem to get the two. You raise the question of impeachment. I think we should talk about 25th Amendment's another kind of issue and all of that. I, I, we had an, an earlier, I guess I, I talked on Cato's podcast about this. I'm, I would like, to, if he's going to be impeached and removed, I would like for it to be clear cut so that a rational person and maybe three, two thirds or three quarters of the population says, yeah, he's got to go. I, I think, you know, to remove him because he is the way he is, uh, is may well be justified. You might constitutionally that might be there, but I think we have to worry about making things worse than they are. In the following sense, having a significant part of the population running around thinking that this was a illegitimate act would not be good because the. Uh, doubts about the legitimacy of the government are, to some extent, what caused Trump himself. And, you know, we, I think uh, there needs to be some consent, not perfect, but there ought to be some. And the thing about it is he may do things or things may come out where, you know, two out of three people, no matter whether they supported him or not, say, yeah, that's just way... Uh, he's he's guilty. It's not they just haven't made it up. It's not a deep state state conspiracy. It's not just the Dems got power in 2018 and they're doing a partisan thing. No, this is like, yeah, it's that's what we got. But we're not anywhere near there yet, and uh, we don't. You know, uh, it's not clear that he will have done that. I do, I do think, of course, you're paying a legitimacy price now too. Um, and the 25th Amendment, Gene has convinced me, is, you know, that's, I mean, he would have to uh, be stark raving mad uh, uh, in some situation to get that done. Again, there, you're probably really talking about a much more higher demand on consent. I mean, I think it's, he, he would have to be, it would have to be Wilsonian, in that he has a stroke or something like that and he's incapacitated or he begins to behave in ways that we associate with madness. Uh, so that again, there's been a little chatter about this this last week. That, you know, there's something wrong with the world we're living in here. We have every week we go through this stuff. We could come in here every week and talk about the things that have gone on. This isn't the way it's supposed to be and even though the consequences you know the year has been good in some ways even from a libertarian perspective we're seeing we got Chris Edwards has talked a long time about tax reform we got some of that and so on but you know it's been very weird and just not as terrible as expected and I just don't know where we're going Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.